Hello again, folks. Good to be together. Worldview family. And as you know, we've been doing several of these video interviews on various topics. And today we're looking at the whole subject of parenting. And you know what? This is uh, just a great opportunity that we as a staff have had to do these Thursday evening uh, uh, talks. And uh, it's been very enlightening, very enlightening. And today we're going to be talking about parenting teenagers, which I am not familiar with. Pastor Gary has already done this and he and uh, Judy are empty nesters now. And uh, amen. And he says, amen. Uh, so Someday, my two kids will be teenagers, and uh, I guess I look forward to that. But uh, we figured, why don't we ask somebody that's currently going through that? So we've asked uh, Pastor uh, uh, Blair and Angela Mercer to join us today on this wonderful topic. So thank you guys for, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. Glad to have walked even Pastor Gary through his own teenagers. I was a youth pastor with two of his teenagers. And, you know, I think they contributed a little bit to my gray hair. Uh-huh. <laughs> and my no hair. <laughs> Definitely. Actually, grandkids think that I should either wear a toque or a, a trucker's hat backwards. They think that that would be very appropriate for me so, yeah. grandparent kids are never wrong so <laughs> never wrong no no, no. <laughs> uh, oh, it's uh it's great to have you guys and uh to be able to uh, get your insight on this this topic uh why don't you tell us a little bit before we, we get rolling here of uh, who you guys are what you're doing and a little bit about your family and and all that kind of stuff that would be awesome well, when you guys first brought this topic to us, we laughed and we were like, we don't know anything about raising teenagers. <laughs> I think we feel like you just fly by the seat of your pants and you hope for the best and you pray to the Lord, right? Um, but we are um, pastors together at a church. We met in Bible college. Blair was the first person I met and I locked him down 12 days later, or at least I really tried to. And um, actually, right after he, um, while you were doing your internship, I guess, we, before he even graduated Bible college, we started in London at uh, Glad Tidings Assembly way back then. So we have been in London since we got married and since we graduated. And so that is 21 years now. And we have two kids. Isaac is 17. Michaela is 16. And um, yeah, we feel lately, we're like, oh my goodness, we are only a couple years shy of being empty nesters, which is super, super strange. Before COVID, we were, we were saying that, we were like, hey, we're alone again. <laughs> <laughs> the kids are out, you know. The kids are out. Uh, with the car or uh, at friend's house and or working and, uh, you yeah. know, where, where did our time go? We yeah. used to be so busy and now we're less busy. Yeah. Remember, there were many times that I would go out to get into the car and there would be no cars available. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'd be walking. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I would I would have been one of those teenagers that would have been in one in one of those yeah. cars that weren't available back in the day. Probably sure. not, probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. That yeah, that's so great. I remember uh growing up and uh going to glad tidings and uh, probably causing you a little bit of grief flair and uh but uh no, I... it's part of the course it's fun the the grief is the fun too if you're not, <laughs> not having some fun we're in trouble no pain no gain right <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> No pain. Well, it's it's uh it is awesome to to have you guys and some of the history there is is uh, really great and even getting to meet your kids and stuff and and see them grow even from a distance and that stuff it, it is awesome it is awesome to see you know i think uh, talking to some of our our people uh tonight because this is uh filmed in the day but we are streaming these at uh, seven o'clock on thursdays uh what are some of the struggles when transitioning from parenting a middle schooler to a teenager because i noticed that uh there's a lot of middle schoolers that we'll have even here and it could be something where they were absolutely wonderful to deal with, deal with, you know what I mean by that, to parent. 
And then all of a sudden they go to high school and it's a totally different thing. And uh, it's like a night and day thing. Uh, what are some of those struggles with, in that transition? What would you say? Yeah, I, I would say um, because I was a youth pastor for 12 years and spent a lot of times encouraging parents like this to realize that I had this theory of when kids are about to move out, uh, they need to be prepared for life on their own. And so I would rather them make their own decisions. Like this is all a theory, you know, because I hadn't been teenagers yet. And so it would be like two years or so before they move out, they need to feel like what it is to own their own responsibility to own their own life, uh, to make decisions and that you could help them with the consequences, whether they're good or bad in that last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So somewhere between middle school and high school, the theory idea is, is slowly let go of the rules. Wow. So letting go of you controlling every decision they make slowly, but surely giving them more and more responsibility and it's, it's, and what I didn't realize was every time I wanted to give my, I thought this is where I should be giving them responsibility. The other side of my brain would say, oh, they're not ready yet. Oh. And the idea is that they're never ready until you give it to them and then they figure it out and then they become ready. So becoming ready is, is giving them that before they're actually ready. So there's a tension there that's like, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, I'm scared that you're like, it's not all the rules, but between I would say grade seven and grade 11, it's so slowly, you're going to have to make the call on this one. And then I wait for them almost to say, okay, well, what would you suggest? Or what's the wise thing to do? What and, do you think? And then I would say everything, but argue in my head. You get, you'll get to argue in my head. Don't manipulate. Don't right. control their answer. But I want to. Like, <laughs> like, like I really want to show them that they're an idiot if they don't do it my way. That's what I want to do. Like, and you won't, you won't, like, I rub my head or rub my head. Like, there, there is so many lines. So, uh, so homework is one, right? You cannot, in high school, cannot care more for their, their homework than they do. You can't. Right. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. You can't care for their homework more than they do. So all, all you can do is, so you, so you have homework today? It's done. Your homework's done? That's it. That's it. That's it. Hmm. Yeah. That's hard to let go. Yeah. That's an example. Or dances. Yeah. I think emotions too, when they're younger, you're dealing with a certain set of emotions. You're dealing with some certain friend issues and things like that. It only gets intensified as they get older. And right. so again, like kind of trying to walk them through um, emotionally, how to handle things, how to deal with their emotions, how to talk it through, all that sort of stuff um, just gets more intense as they get older. Some things lessen for sure. And you, you're dealing less with certain things, but then in there are the other areas where you're like, you know, you're still dealing with it. And now it's actually more intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really good. It that's really good advice. Um, I would always kind of, and you have no idea about this, Pastor. I would, I would always uh, be baffled uh, because I was uh, good friends with your son Mike growing up. I was always baffled by the no curfew thing. Mm -hmm. No curfew. That was not. That did not fly. You were at home. However, by, if you're going to if you're going to be out after midnight, you had to let us know. Yeah, where you yeah. were. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that was something I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. I, I I was like, really? You just have to call. That's how it works. Yeah, but if you don't call, it's over. <laughs> well, knowing, knowing, Mike, <laughs> knowing Mike, you know he could do all the damage before midnight. It didn't matter what time he said. <laughs> It was over anyway. <laughs> oh no! But that was something that what it was the idea of. Um, trust the idea of trust was a huge thing i remember uh different just oh really that's how it works at your house very interesting i remember longing for that trust that was you something, know, something that, was that we did and this isn't for everybody but with our three kids when they turned 16 i would give them the talk about your mom and i have done everything we can to prepare you for life there's not much more that we can teach you 
And so we're letting go of the reins now and you're gonna make mistakes and you're gonna disappoint us and all of that, but we're gonna walk through this together. And uh, we just trust that you're gonna make the right decisions, but you know, if you don't, we're here to help you. You, all, you know, you can always come to us. So um, I don't know if that was good or bad. It seemed to work for us in helping to build that trust level because we really did feel, look, if you're in our home for 16 years and you haven't got the drill yet, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there's not much more we can teach you guys <laughs> well anyway uh, that's probably... good that's good this is something i felt very strongly about when thinking about what questions do do we ask today how do you juggle trying to have a fun relationship uh with your kids while maintaining your role as the parent like some i'll see this a lot of the times you kind of want to be that friend you want to be the friend, but you you want to maintain that balance mm -hmm. of, okay, I can be fun. I'm not an ogre. I'm not this like mean tyrant parent, but I'm, I'm still your parent. How do you do that? It's funny. We have a lot of fun in our house and we get along great with our kids and we do have a lot of silliness, but we also have a line that is repeated often. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You, you are not equal to the parents. Yeah, and uh, we're not friends. Um, <laughs> we actually say that to them so often because especially both our kids have extremely strong personalities. And so there are lots of moments where you're clashing mm -hmm. and we have very independent, stubborn children like ourselves. Okay. So they come by it honestly. But when that happens, they come up against us. And so when those moments happen and we are standing toe to toe, it is like, oh, we're not friends right now. Yeah, <laughs> there's not. It, it's a tough. It's it's tough because because um, uh, because you don't want to make excuses for the parents to say that, OK, we're parents, so we're allowed to yell at you, but you're not allowed to yell at us. Mm. So there, there's a fine line of transition here to back to like the, even the last question of like the controlling parent to the, to the influential parent, the influential parent is optional, right? The kids are going to say, I will I'll gradually allow you to have influence, but it's totally up to them if you are still an influencer in their life. So how you talk, and I think we, we run that difference. We're both middle children, and so we're we're both loud. And so both of our kids are products of two loud people. So the house is very loud. And so we're just uh, in general for us later on in teens, 16, 17, uh, is is just maintaining the respect level and communication. You um, you don't get to talk to us like that. You still have to respect us as parents. We're not listening now that you're freaking out. No. Yeah. No. Uh, no, we do not insult you like you're insulting us. That might be a regular thing. <laughs> so, the, so there's some of that. Uh, but I think all, all because we, we, we said that all the way along, that we're not friends, we're your parents, we're your friends, we're your parents. And so we, that's the baseline. And so we can have fun whenever we want, but they won't forget that. No. No. And what's, what's really interesting, too, is that um, we've said that statement to them their whole lives. Like, mm. and, and I mean... Don't get me wrong. It's not like we're like every day hammering. I'm not friends with you. It's not like that. It's just like in those moments where you're like, oh, wow, um, I am not your friend. Like, you don't talk to me like that or, you know, whatever. Um, my daughter said to me last week, mom, all of my friends can't believe that Isaac and I talk to you guys about everything. Like none of our friends say they talk to their parents and tell them everything like we do you guys. And I'm like, okay, like, so we've still done something yeah. right that even though we drew that line very, very clearly, um, we still have um, tons of open communication, which is, which has yeah. been awesome. So we we've, we get to focus more on having fun, right? But we get, to, we get to like we can lean more on that than ever. But I don't know. Maybe that answers your question, maybe. Right. <laughs> I think it does. I I think that's good. I remember um, uh, my wife saying Nicole. She said that uh, uh, her parents, when uh, her and her sister were getting married. Uh, both said now that they were out of the house and, and the relationship is now going to begin to change mm -hmm. and uh, things that really are friendship like are going yeah. to form. So it's going to be different. 
So we're yeah. still your parents. Uh, you know, that will never change. But now this is fun for us because then we get to go into a different part of life yeah. and that's friendship. I thought that was a beautiful thing. Yeah. And, and it is true. Like, um, uh, you can kind of see that happening even when my in-laws will come over, there's a real friendship bond and it's different than it was when we were first dating, yeah. you know, and, uh, that's, that's great advice guys. I, I love that. I think that's fantastic. Um, we talked, you talked a little bit about communication for a second. Um, and you kind of hit on this a little bit. Uh, how do you keep that communication open with your teen? So, uh, yeah, um, especially with teenagers, I, I would say, um, and it's this is similar to accountability in the church as well. Um, I've learned through a few co courses that I've taken of life coaching that most of the time when accountability is in place, um, the, the only way we hold people accountable often is with shame, guilt, and consequences. So somebody's admitting something that they're struggling with, they're, they're doing something wrong, and then you tell, you know, talk it through, and then you're like, okay, so what are you gonna do if that happens again? And it's often shame, guilt, and consequences. And I think parenting has often leaned on that. Mm -hmm. You're like, if you break the rules, I, you will feel bad because you broke relationship with your, your parent, and uh, there'll be consequences. So uh, all of that does to a teenager or a child gradually older, I understand there's a, absolutely a place for, for some of that in earlier life. But now as a teenager, absolutely. If you want them to stop talking, this is not the road. It was like, if I confess to my parents what I'm going through or what I'm saying, was that there's going to be punishment. So I'm not talking to them. Right. That would be ridiculous. There's a consequence. And then they make me feel bad. And dad's a preacher. So he was like, dad's long lectures are too long. And I'm like, I don't think they're that long. And I think they're very interesting. <laughs> but that doesn't matter anymore. So uh, if you want to keep them open, accountability has to find a different level. It has to find a different level. Uh, you've got to be careful on the shame, guilt, and consequences if you want them to actually Come actually on. tell you anything. And that's not even – like, they'll shut down all small talk because yeah. they're afraid it leans into, like, a real conversation. Yeah. So you're like, uh, what are you going to have to do about that? Or what do you think is wise about that? Or how do you think you should walk forward on that? So one of the ways even – back to the accountability and the rest of it, it came to a spot of, okay, you're 16 now. The Wi-Fi is turning off at midnight, but I am now removing the hours of the day on your device's limit. You right. should put your own, on your own phone on time thing, you're like, you should put what you think is appropriate. And when you warn yourself, you should ask yourself, is this good? Should I continue? Should I not continue? Yeah. They're like, and how would you like me to motivate you to not have too much time on your device, things like that. Mm -hmm. The other thing we've really tried to do is um, um, just have very intentional moments of um, like family meetings. So yeah. um, we try regularly rarely to sit down at the table and just talk about how's life, how's everything going, how are friends, how is school, how's family, like, and try and get our kids to talk. And that way, if there's something in the family that we need to address at that time, then we can address it as a family and say, this is something that, you know, has been coming up fairly regularly. How should we deal with it? What we should, should we do? And so one of the other things that we do is um, before school starts in September, um, the night before school starts, we take our kids out to a restaurant and have appetizers and we just talk about the year ahead. And so we've been doing that for probably 10 years now, where we just sit with the kids and we talk about, okay, school's starting sure. tomorrow. What are some goals you have? Like, what is something you'd like to accomplish this year? How can we help you? You know, whether it's to do with homework and time management and all that kind of stuff. And, and then that way, like even just family stuff kind of comes up during those conversations too. So again, like it's so much easier having conversations with our kids when emotions aren't at play. So right. if we can have family meetings, if we can have family moments of talking about how we function as a family, when I'm not raging and angry, <laughs> all the better. So building in intentional time for conversation and just keeping our kids talking. And even just one last thing is like, 
having an open door policy. So, um, you know, knocking on the kids doors and going right in They're teenagers, they're 16 and 17. I hate that they spend so much time in their bedrooms. And of course, COVID has only like intensified this because they both have been doing schoolwork from home. So their desks are in their room and they're in their rooms and Blair and I are working from home. So they're taking their lunches into their rooms and you're like, Oh my gosh, are you in your room 24 seven? They're they're more hamsters than people now. (laughs) I know. And if they want to talk, it's at 10 o'clock at night. I'm falling asleep or yeah. during my tv show which was last night isaac was downstairs and we had paused like six this times and he's, he's like Why talking and they end up talking about math and it's like for 25 minutes in the middle of my show while it's paused and anyways it's just like like when they want to talk you pause and we talk and so yeah and try, and try not to be irritated and try not to be irritated <laughs> try, try. <laughs> try try again Yes, this is good stuff. I, I'm I'm enjoying this. This this gives me hope for the future. Um, this it's is something not to do. <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted to ask this as as being in youth ministry, um, being a youth pastor. Um, this is something that I think is really important. And of course, you guys being in youth ministry for for twelve years, right, Blair? Um, is youth ministry valuable for my teen? And if so, can the parent, what can the parent do to encourage involvement in youth ministry and youth group and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, we think it's important, pretty important, because um, we, kids understand learning by, um, by doing, and they learn by discussing, and they learn by being open. And they need to learn that it's, uh, it's more than just your parents that believe this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so one of our favorite families uh, had said it this way, uh, the Jacksons. Uh, which pr- raised pre- pretty three pretty amazing girls um, that we really looked up to. They said, uh, when our kids are, are tired of fighting with us, we want the next people of influence <laughs> to say very similar things. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so they were like, when they're tired of hearing no from us, we hope that they ask a youth leader or their youth pastor, and if they have a good relationship with them, they will. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to hear something that's very similar, just in different words. And and you're like, we we just think it's so important. And still to this day, like they were a part of our first class of Mm -hmm. kids. So this is 2000, 2001, 2002. And we just got like a text from the youngest yeah. Saying that she joined the elder board in her church in Texas. Like that's, that's how close we ended up being. Yeah. It's like forever later, they are growing up, they were married with the kids, they live far away and they're still texting this kind of thing for encouragement and support. And we like, we love that. Yeah. Uh, can't say how. So our kids being involved in a community of people to work out their salvation together is a part of the growth of a teenager. Yeah. So we supplement the two of them mm-hmm. together. And it's not just their spiritual growth. So yes, having those conversations with us about Jesus and about obedience and about God's will for their life, um, us answering them and then going to their youth leader or their youth pastor and hearing a very similar answer, so important. But even more than that, character issues, Mm -hmm. discipline issues. Um, I can tell Michaela till I am blue in the face that she needs to practice her guitar. But when her, her band leader at youth group says, Hey, Michaela, you need to come more prepared for practice. That weighs so much heavier than what a parent says. And so we have seen massive growth in her life in the last couple of years because of that natural consequences, somebody else noticing and somebody else taking a moment to speak into her life. And those are things that you can't get elsewhere. Like it, we just, and, and I mean, it's even harder for us because we were in ministry for so many years that we're like, no, 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 you have to go. You have to be yeah. a part of it. Yeah. And <laughs> after leaving youth ministry and putting my kids into ministry and you're paying for babysitting and you're paying for these kind of programs, you're like, there is no more affordable program on earth, <laughs> in my opinion. In my, so I don't care if it's mission trips expensive. You're like, do you realize what you're getting? Do you, do you have any idea what you're getting? They're taking your kid for three days, feeding them and entertaining them and then equipping them and inspiring them for, for the kingdom. 
I cannot consider a better yeah. bang for my buck. Like there is nothing cheaper in their life. Yeah. I, I pay way more for way less. Yeah. Hundred things. And I think as Christians too, again, speaking as that pastor's wife. Um, when we were in youth ministry, it would irritate me so much. The parents that would spend thousands of dollars on sports stuff and take them away on weekends and retreats and miss Sunday church because of um, tournaments or practices or whatever. Um, and, and, and now we're parents with kids. You're like, um, again, in our humble opinion, youth ministry has to be just as important as those sports. It has to be. And in my opinion, again, you're, you're paying and investing in something that is lifelong, not that they're going to quit when they're 17. Kingdom, or, right? Or 18. And I'm a sports guy, so like, don't. Exactly. Don't, oh, yeah. Don't consider I've, I've seen you play. You're competitive. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, very. And, and my kid is too. Like, the, both of them are. Yeah. And so, uh, no, you, it's not that you can't play competitive sports, but you got to find a way. You have to, to find a way over. to not miss out on church and youth group because that is what you're going to take with you for the rest of your life. Right. It's the building blocks of your faith. And yes. some people are really missing out on that. Well, we serve a God who is the author of reward. He instituted reward from the beginning, right? In the, in the garden, you know, there's a reward for this. So there's, there's things that you can be competitive in at youth group. I mean, the games that we would play, I can't believe some of us are still alive, you know? <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, so Mike, you asked, you asked, how do we encourage people to get involved or how to eat and make that happen um a couple like i don't have the answers for all of them along the way but um we used to say that sometimes kids ministry what one of the goal best things about kids ministry is that it leads into junior highs it leads into high school yeah it's hard to do nothing and then start yeah right uh so uh i would start them early and let it rise uh, that is the by far the easiest way. But that also takes people um, uh, for this, which which is, this, and this usually offends people. So I, I'm apologizing for the offensiveness. But uh, we change churches too much. We move houses too much. We change jobs too much. We change friends too much. When you do this, you'll destroy your kid's community and the church forever. Yeah, I don't no. care. I don't no. care what it costs and the, what you've made money on your house. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> it's not worth it for your kids. Yeah, you're you're really speaking my language now because I just think consistency for uh, teenagers, especially, mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen it as a lead pastor. You know, uh, families pick up and they leave and they go to another church. In my mind, the pastor would have to be a heretic. If my kids were getting something out of the youth group and the ministry in that church, why would I pull them out? I mean, I can listen to podcasts. I can I can do all kinds of things to feed myself. But the focus has to be on the spiritual aspect of my kids. And I, I know this is a big frustration for us as pastors. And as you've already said, we see Pete folks investing all kinds of money in their kids for all kinds of things. And then when it comes to the spiritual things that the church can offer, it's kind of whole hum. Yeah. So, you know, I would encourage parents as well, you know, get, get your kids plugged into youth group, get, get it plugged into church because there's lots of opportunity there for them to grow and develop. And even in their own giftings, you know, just absolutely lots of opportunity for them. So uh, I, I really appreciate what you said there. Absolutely. Uh, now this leads into the next question here. And this is, this is one that's a little bit more, uh, focused on occupation and what you guys are doing, but I think it's very valuable because it can even apply to somebody who's very involved in church ministry. How do you balance church and state in your home? How do you stop talking shop? You know, when it comes home, I remember Ange said this and I'll never forget it because Ange, you just, you shoot from the hip sometimes. And I just love it. I've been in those, those rooms where you speak to leaders and you call everybody out on their mail and, and it's great. And every guy in the room at this event just hung their head in shame that had kids because you were talking about this moment where you told Blair to stop being the pastor at home. Oh, yeah. And I'll never forget that every guy in the room that was a pastor just kind of went, mm. it was, but it was so good. 
Can you t- talk a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, every now and then. Actually, I and I will say, I have rarely had to say that to you. Like the last few years, I probably have never said that. But there was a time where I'd be like, okay, your lecture, your talk with the kids is turning into a lecture, which is turning into a sermon, and you need to stop. <laughs> but he doesn't do well, that anymore. And I think even in that moment, it was like, husbands you don't pastor your wives yeah is yeah. more of the reference so you're right. like i'm not her pastor yeah. <laughs> so be careful how you lecture yeah but, when yeah <laughs> now, kids and on the other hand <laughs> a good lecture <laughs> hold still here it comes uh, and um oh goodness what was i gonna say um oh it's gone oh you'll come back to it because this I, for some of it is this i i I I still every dad lectures a little bit. I mean, come on. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, and I, I I'll tell this to the kids straight though. This is not about Jesus. Oh yeah. This isn't uh, about your dad or your mom or a pastor. At it's church. not because you're a PK. This is not your PK. This is not to do with even Christian at all. This is me. This is dad talking. And don't associate this with the church. This has nothing to do with that. Yeah. You, you're just yeah. gonna have to hit, like. So I I will categorize things for them that way uh-huh. uh so that they can like approach it i'm like don't blame jesus because your dad is a jerk don't <laughs> don't do that like he spent too much time with teenagers to to let you away with those weak excuses like <laughs> like and then you're just gonna have to deal with the fact mm-hmm. that I, I worked with teenagers too much and i heard a lot of the yeah whatever um so we have conversations every now and then about church stuff or whatever and um, of course our kids are older. So they'll be like, what are you talking about? And we'll be like, this doesn't concern you. Well, who are you talking about? No one, you know, and right. you know what I mean? So we will, we will just kind of like shut the conversation down. And so we've had to, we've had to be careful about like when we have conversations and making sure that we're not around the kids when we have those conversations. And every now and then when something mm-hmm. does come up, we try and make it like a teachable moment that like, this is something that we're dealing with right now. And again, we're like, it'll be anonymous, but we'll be like, we're dealing with this situation right now. And this is kind of how it's gone down and how it's played mm-hmm. out. And then we try and use it to like teach our kids so that if they face something like that or if they're dealing with anything like that then then we can say like even just walking through how we're feeling about it and but then how we are how we're going to approach the situation um or bring reconciliation or whatever um but yeah we've had to we've had to be careful we I remember a few years ago the kids saying like you guys are critical and so then we were like okay like and we realized we had to we had to mm, like zip it wow yeah um, that's some huge takes forgiveness like apologies and some of it because kids will take second secondhand offense pretty easily and uh we don't want them to hate the church yeah, yeah. that's important absolutely and secondhand offense is that much harder to let go of right very, you know, very much so. yeah because it's not yours yeah. and so how do you how do you get rid of something that was never supposed to be yours in the first place it's mm-hmm. very very difficult guys that this is really good i'm getting goosebumps talking uh <laughs> talking to you guys this has been so so good um uh let me just see here what are some things parents need to be aware of that their teens are dealing with i thought this was was a really good cross platform you know across the board kind of question uh what are some things that parents need to be aware of that their teens are dealing with and what would be some signs that their teens are dealing with those specific things that you are going to mm. bring up? This is a yeah. tough, it's a very tough question. Yeah. You should go first. Um, okay. <laughs> I will just say, first and foremost, uh, depending on your personality type, I feel like most of us are pretty bad listeners. Um, and because we live in a society and a culture that is so busy, And we are multitasking all of the time. Um, We are so distracted that you can have a suffering teen in your home and not know they're suffering. Mm. And so you have to, as a parent, discipline yourself and become hyper aware of facial expressions and mannerisms and body language. And so even just starting there, um, that you, you need to pay attention to your teen. Um, 
I would say one of the big ones we're, we're facing right now is anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something that many teens are struggling with. And Blair and I have had our own share of frustration with this one because many times it's just that the kids aren't learning. They haven't figured out how to deal with their emotions yet. Right. They haven't figured out how to handle that anxiety. And there's actually a really good amount of anxiety that's actually good for you. If you didn't prepare for this test and it's tomorrow, that's good anxiety. Yeah. You should have been studying a long time ago. If you're having anxiety because you did something wrong and you need to make it right and you need to apologize to somebody about it, that is a good, healthy amount of anxiety. So when does that anxiety, though, turn into something that is unhealthy? Um, as parents, we need to be able to read it and have conversation and work through it and figure it out if there needs to be some next steps. But even in just saying all of that, I think the emotions just just emotions mm -hmm. helping your students like deal with them how to talk about them how to verbalize how they're feeling how to and I mean the internet is a wonderful place because I know for me I have been able to look up okay struggling with anxiety what are some uh, what are some ways that you know we can deal with it how can how can you get yourself out of a pit so to speak right right and um and so, yeah, I think for me, it's paying close attention to emotions. It's good. It's good. I, I have found um, such a broad question, maybe just trying to stay aware of all the things going on in teenagers and then being able to have open conversations about it when, whenever it could possibly. So a friend, uh, I would say Brett Allman is my go-to on that. He's got lots of great resources on his YouTube channel and he's okay. done this manual on teenagers and understanding teenagers. Mm -hmm. You just sort of have to like be generally aware of all the things they could be going from and looking, looking for opportunities to like, Hey, let's talk about that. Hey, let's talk about that. Hey, let's talk about that. Hey, Hey, what's going on in the classroom? Hey, what's weed like? What's alcohol like? What's parties are like? What, what, what's the sex conversation among high school kids? What's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah. You sort of just keep them talking, keep them asking, yeah. try not to judge. Yeah. Um, I'll also say that because we have one boy and one girl, um, guys, <laughs> and I'm, I'll just speak for my family, rarely ever deal with friend issues because guys are just sort of able to brush it off and move on and grunt and whatever. I grunt. swear, I swear, said grunt. I swear you don't even have to say <laughs> sorry. You just wake up the next day and they figured it out. Yesterday was yesterday and we're friends again today. Um, when you have a girl relationships and girls will be such a huge part of parenting that I just never saw it coming. And especially between the ages of 11 and 13, those are the hardest years. But even after that, it continues. And what's so crazy about it is, again, they're just learning how to be a good friend. They're yeah. learning how to um, shrug things off, forgive, extend grace. They're learning how to have conversations and actually say, Hey, what you did there hurt my feelings. Like they're learning how to actually have communication. And so that is such an important one to help your girls navigate through. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and again, that is a, that is a lifelong lesson of just learning how to be a good friend you will have good friends if you are yourself a good friend mm -hmm. and that's a tricky one yeah that's that's some great advice and that that is a, a tough question for sure uh what what do you think that the church should be doing to equip parents to be the the priests of their home um yeah that's um there's a bit of a catch-22 with that especially i would say for fathers and uh, husbands uh like uh from what i've learned from life coaching is that information doesn't change people's lives motivation does and so often people are only motivated to do what they come up with their own solutions for sometimes the church is guilty of 
idea, 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 idea. But because you gave me the idea, I'm not motivated to do it. And the more I understand it makes sense. I just don't want to do it because you told me to do it. Gah! Like there's this like this weird tension of like the more you tell a, a husband or a father to say, you should pray with your kids. You should pray with the kids. For some reason, the harder it is to do that, you have to get over that bump, you know, um, it's weird. We all know we should. We all know we should, like, in, in the general priest ideas, like being priest of your home. But uh, how to motivate them is, is a bit of a catch-22. And the other catch to, to all of this is that the more, the, the only people that ever need to be reminded and encouraged are the people that are never looking at these things so i find i find don't you find that if you do a parent team kind of meeting like this whatever it's all the parents that are doing a great job that show up all the time yeah <laughs> right and they never hear anything new yeah but they keep showing up to hear stuff they already know because they're already doing a great job and they want and they want to do a better job <laughs> they want to do a better job but it's like it's so it's, it's sort of like so the only way i never need the seminar is if I always go and then I'll feel like I never need it. And you're like, this is so bizarre. But this is repeatedly it. It's the parents who are always reading that never have to be reading because their kids are great. And you're like, you, you see how that's going. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to motivate. Uh, uh, I would throw out, um, you know, without too much. I would do, I, f I think we, we've done personality tests like the Enneagram lately that has helped us understand how our kids think and feel. Right. And that way our communication has been better around the house. And that's been a good motivator. Okay. And uh, so I'm not saying don't do seminars. Don't get me any wrong. Oh, sure. No, I, I agree. That, that, <laughs> guys, I'm taking it all in. It's great. <laughs> we should. But it's, a, it's just like this general don't – don't quit, never quit on giving the general reminders. You know, okay. there was a time as a youth pastor, I actually made um, family devotions two a week for a whole year, for a whole year. Like I made my own book because I went out to find one that I would suggest to my parents of our church and they couldn't find a parent and teen devotional guide. I couldn't, couldn't find one. So you're like, fine, I'll write my own. I wrote it. I made 300 copies. They all took it. I tried to give accountability to the parents to do it. I can't, it's of the 300 books that went out and families that said that they would do it over five years. I, I don't, I don't actually have a solid, like very few, an embarrassing, very few amount. And maybe it's because I tried to equip them more than I tried to motivate them. Hey, I, I'm in a um, Bible study with 55 other youth pastors and maybe only 20 of them have actually made it and done their work for the past 20 days. So, and we're, we're supposed to be the ones that we love this stuff and we're in this stuff and then we're going to try and get parents to do this stuff and they've got other real jobs and all this kind of stuff. This is, this is great stuff, guys. This is really, really great. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for, for just really blessing us today it's been it's been fantastic to hear from you guys and and to take the time out so thank you it's encouraging people watching did you know that ministry people are normal <laughs> so so good thank you yeah thanks a lot guys be here we love talking about our kids and uh, we love working with working with other churches especially within our city that we are all working together we love that yeah love that. we do thank you so much for having us mike i was just going to say i think one of the things that we can do in the local church is acknowledge that there are families and that parents have struggles and that we're there for you and i you know i think blair's brought up a great idea like we can spew out all these ideas like i mean we've got all kinds of ideas sometimes i think what people really need from us the most is we're, we're no, we know you're there. We know you're going through it. Yeah. We're with you. If you need help, we're here yeah. for you. We're praying for you. Yeah. We're in this together. Yeah. And then I think Blair, you brought a great point about collectively in the city. If there was ever a time where we needed to be together and support one another, it's today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, thanks for coming on you guys. Uh, you've been a great blessing and, 
of course, uh, we love Gateway and all that you're doing on the west side there to just uh, expand the kingdom of God. And so we just pray God's blessing on you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. And uh, we encourage you to uh, join us uh, uh, for these Thursday night talks and, and pass this on. If this has been helpful to you watching, just share it uh, in your Facebook and, and on some of your social media platforms so that you can bless somebody else today. And we look forward to seeing you on the weekend for our 11 a.m. gathering uh, via live stream. It's going to be great. So God bless you tonight. And we're just believing that uh, you're going to uh, just really um, uh, have healthy relationships in your families and with all with your children. And we're believing for God's best for you today. So take care. Amen.